Well, good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing tonight? Everybody get their belly full of nachos? Was that good? Well, listen, go ahead and stand on your feet tonight. Uh, Erica's on vacation. Uh, she'll be back Sunday. But uh, Helen and Samantha so graciously, and Helen says she's trying to get over her nerves tonight. But I told her, don't worry about that one bit. Amen. And um, they're going to lead us in a, in a couple songs, and then we're going to go to the Word. But it's so good to see everybody tonight. And uh, I don't know about you, but as you go through the week, it seems like the thoughts in your mind just kind of pile up. I want to give you a chance tonight to just unload. And just unload all of that and just let God touch your life tonight. Amen. Let's just join the Lord in a, in a word of prayer and then we'll worship. Amen. Father, I thank you tonight for giving us the opportunity to come into your house and lift up your name. And we thank you, God, that you're above and beyond all of our circumstances. And Lord, we thank you that you're moving. Even when we can't see it, God, we thank you that you're moving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.
Oh, come on, worship him just a moment. Come on, just exalt the Lord. Let's just exalt the Lord just a moment. God, we exalt you in this place today. Lord, we lift up your name, Lord, because you are high above the earth. Oh, that ought to make somebody shout tonight to know that our God is high above everything that's going on in this earth. He is seated in majesty tonight. Hallelujah. Lord, you're ruling and reigning over this earth, and we praise you. We glorify you, God, for who you are. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If you love the Lord tonight, give him a hand clap of praise as we're seated. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies, so much. Give Helen and Samantha a hand tonight. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Well, what a, uh, what a beautiful week we're having going into Easter weekend. And I was thinking just over the last couple of days, this is... This is, for, we're celebrating forgiveness this weekend. If you had to just sum up what Easter really means in one word, we're celebrating forgiveness. It's when Christ came once and for all so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins. And just to think about that, I don't have to bear the burden of my issues in my past. Is anybody glad tonight other than me that you don't have to carry that burden with you? Has anybody got a past other than me? Come on, somebody help me. I mean, that I don't have to carry that, that I was forgiven. Man, what a, and I want to talk about that tonight. I know the, um, uh, I've been talking about the churches and revelations, and I'm going to get back on those next week. But just because this was Easter week, I really felt like it was important tonight that I wanted to talk about the necessity of forgiveness. Because it was a necessity for you and I to be forgiven. Does everybody recognize that? It was a necessity. We needed to be forgiven of our sin. Without forgiveness of sins, you and I would be doomed. Without forgiveness of sins, we may as well just bar the doors on this church, let the bank come and take the whole place over. Without forgiveness of sins, we're just going through some kind of motion that's worth nothing. It was a necessity that we be forgiven. And, and, and God recognized that it was a necessity, so much of a necessity that he sent his only son. I want you to think about how much you love your children. He sent his only son to die so you could have forgiveness of your sins. And I love all you a lot, but I'm not sending my son to die for you. And I don't, I don't imagine you would for me either. I mean, I just want you to grasp for a moment how great of a necessity that God saw that forgiveness was. He was willing to go the extra mile and make sure that forgiveness, once and for all, took place. Now I want to read a couple of verses and give you a couple of thoughts tonight on the necessity of forgiveness. Matthew 6, I'm going to read actually verses 12 through 15. I think, I think I've got 9 through 15 written there, but let's start with verse 12. It says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I want to read this also out of the Weymouth translation. It says, forgive us our, shortcoming, our shortcomings as we also have forgiven those who have failed in their duty towards us. Man, I like the way that is worded. For God, we forgive those that have failed in their duty towards us. How many of you have ever felt like somebody failed in their duty towards you? Somebody's not telling the truth. How many of you are married tonight? Come on, have you? There you go. I better move on. <clears throat> it says, and bring us not into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. And I want to stop right there and say that when you don't allow forgiveness to reign in your heart, you open the door for the evil one to come in and tempt you to go a direction you shouldn't go. 
I, I, I truly, truly, truly believe this, that unforgiveness is possibly the, gr the greatest key Satan uses into the life of a believer. Unforgiveness can be an open door for you to start getting involved in alcohol, drugs, uh, sexual sins, whatever the case may be, unforgiveness is an open door for the enemy. It's an open door. It goes on to say, for if we forgive others their offenses, our Heavenly Father will also forgive us. But if we don't, do not forgive others their offenses, neither will our he Heavenly Father forgive ours. Forgiveness means this, to totally forgive all debt and bring the balance to zero. To bring it to zero. Now, as you think about people in your life that may have hurt you, maybe there's been a root of unforgiveness that you've been, it's been hard for you to get over, but you may say, well, I've dealt with that, I've moved on. I want to ask you a question tonight. How many of you have a balance of zero concerning that person? How many people have a real balance of zero? Not everybody has a zero balance, I can assure you. I can, even, even the Lord's disciples didn't. I really don't ever, I don't ever read in, in Scripture where there was really but one person that walked around with a zero balance, and that was Jesus himself. I know we have a lot of people that wear halos. Bless their heart. Go get them something to polish them with for Christmas. But make sure your balance is zero. Listen, it, it, forgiveness means that you permanently forfeit the right to all reproach. Look at that first word, permanently. Somebody tell me what permanently means. It's, it's, it's set in stone. It's over. It's done with. I won't return. It's, 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 it's the way it is, permanently. I forfeit the right to even get in reproach. That means that even six months down the road, when that person's name or that person does something again, you know, nope, nope, nope. I permanently forfeited my right to all reproach. I'll never forget, um, it's probably been about six months ago, I read a quote from Mother Teresa. She was at some type of event before she died, and somebody uh, came up to her at this event and said, Mother Teresa, that person standing over there, she didn't mention who that person was, she said, didn't they do something that really offended you? And, they, and Mother Teresa looked at this person, and she said, I specifically remember forfeiting all right to remember that. That's pretty powerful. She said, I specifically remember I forfeited all right to even remember that. The last part of this definition of forgiveness says refusing. Let me, does anybody sometimes just have a trouble Harnessing, harnessing your flesh when you get angry. Refusing to privately or publicly tear down. And if we could just be honest about it, let me tell you something your flesh likes. Well, Pastor, how do you know what my flesh likes? Because mine likes it too. When somebody has really done you wrong, Let's face it, there's sometimes we just overreact, but there's other times people really do mean harm to you. And when that happens, it feels good to your flesh to tear them down. If you say, well, Pastor, not mine, well, well something's wrong with you. Because your flesh enjoys that. If you're honest about it, it feels good to tear that, that flesh desires to tear that person down. But how many of you know that we're not made of, we, in this earth we're made of flesh and blood, but we are reborn in spirit. We are remade in the image of Jesus himself. God always gives his children the ability to forgive, and it is a choice. Forgiveness is not something that just magically comes. Doesn't do that. Forgiving someone is a choice. It doesn't say it's not a difficult choice. 
It doesn't say that. But forgiving someone is a real choice. Our foundations as Christians is based completely upon the principle of forgiveness. We believe that Jesus Christ forgave us of our sins. Imagine for a moment if we could collectively put all the sins in this room and just put them into one, put them into one sack up here on stage and add them all up together. What a heavy and ugly sack of sins that would be. But Jesus stepped into the picture and forgave you. It was his choice. The Bible says that he willingly went to the cross. And even in, his, even in the fleshly part of him, he even cries out in the last hours, Lord, Father, if there, God, if you can find any other way, I'm open to it. That's what he said. He said, if there is any other way. But then he goes on to say, Lord, but nevertheless, I want your will to be done. And if it's me being that all-sufficient sacrifice, being crucified, then I, I'm willingly going to go to the cross. And he did. He willingly went to the cross for you and I. It was a choice. Where the problem comes in is where humans are often not like God in this way is God's love, the Scripture tells us over and over and over, it is steadfast. The Bible says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Me and Stephanie could get in an argument tonight and say something ugly to one another that we should not say, but that does not separate us from God's love. I may be sleeping on the couch for a couple days, but it doesn't separate me from the love of the Lord. Why? But why? Because he loves me, and I can get that right, and I can repent. And that just because I had a moment where I messed up, that doesn't separate me from God's love. But as humans, when people do us wrong, our love becomes very conditional. Becomes very conditional. It's easy for me to love somebody that never complains, that never, never, never argues, never fights, never has. It, it's easy to love someone like that, but you take somebody in your life, they always have an issue. They always have a complaint. They always have a problem. Sometimes it's a choice to love that person. And God's love is unconditional. We need to learn that we need to have unconditional love towards one another. And the only way we can do that is through Jesus. There are people in this life you can't love enough in yourself without having the love of Jesus inside of you to help guide and push you in that direction. Psalm 103, 11 says, great is his mercy towards us. I don't know about you, but I am thankful for God's mercy in my life. His mercy is great towards me. His mercy is great towards me. How much mercy do we show others? How, how many chances has the Lord given some of us? I've seen some of you go, whoo, you got lightheaded even thinking about it. How many chances has God given us? How many, let me ask you this, how many chances do we give other people? I mean, really, when it gets down to brass tacks, how many chances do we give other people? Listen, in the day in which we live, where everybody is so easily offended, we don't even give them three strikes a lot of times. And I want to ask you, how, many, how much mercy do you show others? Offenses are going to come, and there is nothing you can do to stop it. If you, as long as you have air running through your lungs, there is nothing you can do to stop offenses from coming into this life. How you handle offenses is your responsibility, not the offender. What we want to do is we want the offender to change so we can be happy again. Oh, come on, somebody. Don't leave me by myself. We want the person that's the offender, we want them to change so they'll line up with what we feel. Then we can be happy again because we have things our way. 
I mean, let's be honest. How many people like things their way? I know we'll have a few halo wearers with that too. It's your responsibility how you handle offense. It's not the offender's. It's on you. It's your choice. We are never created to be a storage tank for anger. Have you ever met someone that is a storage tank of anger? When I think about that, I can think of a couple people throughout my life that they were literally a storage tank of anger. There was always a complaint. There was always an issue. You couldn't sit down and have a normal conversation with, I mean, there was just a storage tank of anger there, but we are rather called to be a holding tank of mercy. We are connected to heaven. How many of you recognize tonight because we've been born again because, because of what we celebrate this week because Jesus willfully went to the cross. He was crucified. Not only was he crucified, but he rose again just like he said on the third day. And he extended all of that mercy. Listen, even at the cross, the story at, at the cross is one of the, to me, one of the most amazing stories in Scripture. He's up there, but he's up there between two thieves. And one of the thieves is asking Jesus, "Listen, can I, can you help me in my dying moments?" And even though Jesus has been rejected by the very man most likely that he was crucified beside, he could have very easily said, listen, I'm just doing what I've got to do. But even in his dying moment, listen, the body of our Lord was broken and he was in pain. There was no supernatural saving him from the pain and the agony of the cross. He was beaten beyond recognition. His blood, the lifeblood was spilling out of his body. And he hung there in agony and pain. And in his dying moments, he told that thief on the cross, he said, Ah, yes, I will forgive. I will remember you even this very day. Man, he, our Lord was such a holding tank of mercy. In the middle of his trial and all that he went through, he, never, he didn't lash out. He didn't lash out. He was a holding tank of mercy. Luke 6, 36 is be merciful. Why? Because he's been merciful to you. Be merciful because he has been merciful to you. How many of you recognize that God has been merciful? God's mercy has extended so far in my direction. When someone offends you and it's coming, I want you to recognize that somebody's going to offend you. Most likely before the week is out. Many before the evening is over. I mean, let's just get real. I know, like, I, listen, I, I know we live in a world where some people float around in the clouds. Myself, I'm here. I'm here. Somebody's going to offend you. Make a distinction b between weakness and wickedness. Just because someone has wronged you doesn't make them wicked. It doesn't make them evil just because someone has wronged you. They may just be weak. How about you? How many times maybe have you offended someone? You're not wicked. You were just weak. Do you know if you find a, a dog that's been beaten and broken down and sick and mangy and agitated and weak, do you know what, if you walk up to him, it very well could happen? You may get bit. Because he's weak, life has been rough, and I want to tell you, people are the same way. We need to learn to make a distinction between wickedness and weakness. There may be people that bring offenses into your life that really do mean you harm, and it has been a wicked offense against you. But I want to tell you, we need to recognize, particularly in the church, 
that not all offenses is somebody being evil or wicked. Sometimes people are just weak. Learn to give someone a break. How many of you can just think of a time in your life that God's given you a break? Man. I mean, I, th I thought all the way back to yesterday, and I can think of a time. Come on, somebody. I mean, not just one break, but I think about how many. Let me ask you this. How many of you feel refreshed when you know God's mercy is giving you a break? I, I, I mean, when I, when I realize I didn't get what I deserved, and God, in his mercy, steps in and says, Son, you know what? What you deserve is a spanking every day for 30 days. But instead, I'm going to allow some blessing to flow into your life. I just think, man, God, you're amazing. And I want to ask you this in your life. Do you do the people that offend you the same way? How much of a break do you give people? The scripture said, listen, be merciful just as the Father, just as the Father has been merciful to you. So if the Father has been merciful to you, as Jesus told Peter 70 times 7, which was just a metaphor to say, Peter, there ain't no end to it, buddy. It's over and over and over and over. If God has been merciful to you that many times, why do we struggle so much to be merciful to others? I can tell you what I believe. I believe we haven't really grasped the unconditional love of God. We haven't really grasped that unconditional love of the Father. What do I do when offense comes, Pastor? There, there's two things. There's, two, there's only two choices. You can take it to God or you can take it to others. When you take it to God, it allows the Holy Spirit to give you a better perspective. Can I tell you why it's better? Because his perspective is not of this world, but his perspective is tied into the throne room of heaven where nothing has been disrupted by the offense. That's, that's amazing. We, down here, we can get all disheveled and tore out the frame about something, and in heaven, everything is just, it's just nothing is disrupted. So when an offense comes, you can go to God and say, all right, God, and look, it's okay to be honest with the Lord. And say, Lord, I just want to tell you, I'm mad. I'm angry. Be honest with God. He already knows your heart. It's okay to be honest and say, Lord, this is, and give him the opportunity to allow his Holy Spirit to speak into your life and bring a different perspective that is heaven-based and not based on the things of this world. Or you can go to others. Then you can, when you go to others, you cause them to think less of the offender as well. Now we got another person offended. We got another person offended. When you go to God, you begin to feel peace. You begin to value unity. But when I go to others, I, I've succeeded in getting others to sin by creating division in their relationships too. Do you know what? If you want to look at, at churches that have had major splits, somebody didn't take their offense to the Lord. Because I can tell you what God doesn't do. He doesn't split churches. God doesn't split churches. Somebody hasn't taken their offense to the Lord. We decide that I, when we don't take our offense to the Lord, listen to me, this is like, that is rebellion. Particularly if we know that God can make all, it, the Bible says he can make all things work together for the good of those that are called according to his purpose. So even though the offense came, God says, I'll take that. Now I'm going to work with it. And I'm, if you take it to him, but when you refuse to take it to God, it means, Lord, I'm operating out of rebellion. I know you can make it better, but I'm going to do it my way because I'm angry. And church, I want to tell you tonight, that puts you in a dangerous spot. It puts you in a dangerous spot. God says, I want you to bring it to me. So I can begin to bring peace. And listen, we have a world that is drama-driven. 
I mean, we have reality TV has brought drama to the forefront of the American life. It really has. That's all. All reality TV is some sort of drama. All of it may not necessarily evil drama, but it's all drama driven. That's what reality TV is. And since that's come along over this last 15 or 20 years, it's drama, drama, drama. But God is still crying out, I desire for you to have peace, peace, peace. And peace is the exact opposite of drama. God wants to bring peace back into your life but it can't come if you hold on to unforgiveness. Be careful of what you say when you're offended. Boy, this mouth that we have, I mean, it can get us in trouble. It really can. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the power of life and death is in the tongue. And I know we talk about confessing things over ourselves, and I believe that verse means that as well. But how about what the death we pronounce over others? I mean, just just to be real, when when your flesh is all out of whack because you haven't taken something to the Lord and you decide to deal with it. Listen, you are not none of us. Your pastor is not equipped to deal with offense. My God is equipped to deal with offense. That's why I have to take it to him. I'm not equipped to deal with offense. If I, if I deal with it, I just want to get fighting mad. But God is equipped to deal with offense. He, hey, he's not equipped to deal with it. He's dealt with it. Once and for all, he dealt with offense when he died on the cross. When you go to bed with unforgiveness, you open the door to Satan to plant seeds, and you allow, listen to this, you allow the devil to give you counsel. When you go to bed and or or dwell for days on an offense that's happened, that means you have listen, when you're dwelling on offense, you haven't taken it to God the way you should, and it allows the enemy to begin to counsel you. I want somebody to let that sink in for a moment. You actually allow the enemy to to give you counsel. How many of you would be honest enough to say, Pastor, if you're like me, I got enough problems myself without taking any counsel from the devil. I mean, I'm just being honest. I got enough problems myself. The last thing I need to do is take some counsel from him. But when you are operating in rebellion, refuse to operate in forgiveness, and you handle it your own way, you open the door for the enemy to speak into your life. Whatever God does to you, you should do do it back to others. We read that in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who've done things against us. Blessed are the merciful. You will never reach your destiny in God without forgiving. I want you to recognize this tonight. Jesus, his ultimate destiny was to be the all-sufficient Savior. If you had to sum up, I know he is so much in so many areas and so many things, but if I had to just sum up what was the destiny of my Lord, it was to be my my all-sufficient Savior, the sacrificial Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. That was his destiny. He, He could not complete that without having forgiveness in his heart. And you can't complete your destiny in God without having complete forgiveness in your heart. Our greatest temptation to keep unforgiveness inside comes when we feel justified. Well, I'm mad, and here's why. That they they did wrong. And I'm going to give you two examples. The first one is when Moses... And look, Moses dealt with a lot. He dealt with those stiff-necked Israelites over and over and over and over. And he goes to the Lord and says, Lord, I'm, I'm just sick of these people. He, he told the Lord that a whole lot of times. He said, Lord, I'm tired of them. I don't even know how many times in Scripture. Lord, I'm tired of them. I, mean, I think it was even a couple times. He said, Lord, if you would just strike me down right here. Take me on home. Listen, it's getting bad at that point. It's getting pretty bad. Lord, if you would, just let a light, bolt of light and hit me right in the top of the head. Beam me up, Scotty. I'm out of here. 
And he gets to the place where they're crying out for water, and God says, okay, Moses, speak to that rock, and it'll give you water. Moses said, fine, God, I'll speak to it. He rears back with that stick in his anger and strikes that rock. And in that instance of anger, because he, didn't have, because he was operating out of unforgiveness and anger, he didn't get to go into the promised land. When you keep unforgiveness in your heart, it can keep you from reaching your full potential and destiny in God. But then we have somebody else named David. David was, you know the story of David. He was a young boy. He was anointed to be king. He killed Goliath. Saul couldn't stand him, tried to kill him. I don't know how many times we'd have to look back and try to count them up. He try, uh, who, who knows if the Bible even accounts for all the times that Saul tried to kill David. I mean, he was regularly hunting David down. And all of a sudden, one day, David finds himself in a cave, and Saul comes in to use the bathroom. And... How many of you just love a good Christian friend? David's got a good Christian friend with him. And a good Christian friend, listen, your main counsel comes from the Lord and nobody else. David gets the advice, now's your chance. Run a spear through this guy, take the throne, and be done with it. David said, listen, I'm not supposed to touch God's anointed. And he allowed Saul to live. And that tells me that he had... David operated, the Bible even says he had a heart after God's own heart. David oper learned to operate in full forgiveness. And he was able to take the throne without the blood of Saul on his hands. The only difference in these two men was how they handled an offense. Think about that. Look at all the miracles that Moses did. I mean, God used him to part the Red Sea. He, all the stuff that went on in his life but because he didn't learn how to handle offenses, he didn't get to walk in his full destiny in the Lord. I want to share this story. The day before Christmas, 1943, revenge and not honor is what drove Second Lieutenant Franz Stingler to jump into his fighter that chilly December day. Stigler wasn't just any fighter pilot. He was an ace. One more kill, and he would win the Knight's Cross, German's highest award for valor. Yet Stigler was driven by something deeper than glory. His older brother, August, was a fellow Luftwaffe pilot who had been killed earlier in the war. American pilots continued to kill Stigler's comrades and were bombing his country cities. Stigler was standing near his fighter on a German air brace when he heard a bomber's engine looking up and he saw a B-17 flown by Charles Brown. It was flying so low that it looked like it was going to land. As the bomber disappeared behind some trees, Stigler tossed his cigarette aside, saluted a ground crewman and took off in pursuit. As Stigler's fighter rose to meet the bomber, he decided to attack it from behind. He climbed behind the sputtering bomber, squinted into his gun sight, and placed his hand on the trigger. As he was about to fire without hesitation, Stigler was baffled. No one in the bomber fired at him. He looked closer at the tail gunner. He was still, his white fleece collar soaked with blood, its skin had been peeled away by the shells and his gun knocked out. He could see men huddled inside the plane, tending to the wounds of other crewmen. There were icicles of blood hanging on the inside of the plane. Then he nudged his plane alongside the bomber's wings and locked eyes with the pilot whose eyes were wide with shock and horror. The pilot was Charlie Brown. Stigler pressed his hand over the rosary he kept in his flight jacket. He eased his index finger off of the trigger, and he couldn't shoot. When he locked his eyes on Brown, it caused him to take mercy. Alone with the crippled Brahmer, Stigler changed his mission. 
He nodded at the American pilot and began flying in formation so German anti-aircraft gunners on the ground would not shoot down the slow-moving American plane. Stigler escorted the bomber over the North Sea and took one last look at the American pilot. Then he saluted him, peeled his fighter away, and returned to Germany. Good luck, Stigler said to himself. You're in God's hands. Man, what creates the bond between enemies? Fast forward down the road many years. They met in 1989. Stigler says that when he took notice of how damaged and beat up Charlie Brown's plane was, he said, I just couldn't finish him off. If you take, look this story up on the internet and read this story, he was so moved to tears as he was about to shoot him down, but he will, realized that Brown's plane and the men inside were battered. They were trying to get through the same war that he was in. And he said, I just didn't have the heart to finish him off. He says, I thought maybe they just needed a chance to get back to where they once were and be restored. And I want to ask you tonight, when it comes to the subject of forgiveness in your life towards someone else, how many people in your life are like Charlie Brown's plane? They're just needing someone to give them a chance to get back to where they were before so they can get restored. How many of you know God is in the restoration business? He's in the restoration business. And Helen, if you'd come and play something. And we live in a, we live in this world to where we just have an offended society all the time. You can't watch the news, you can't go anywhere without seeing angry people. But I want to tell you this weekend, this week, we celebrate the opportunity for, to forgive. We celebrate forgiveness. I've been forgiven. I've done offensive things, but I've been forgiven. God's allowed me to be restored. And there are people in your life that God is wanting you to extend a hand of mercy to. There, there, it may be a spouse. It may be a sister. It may be a child. It may be a mother or father. It may be a, a husband or wife. Maybe somebody at your job. But God is saying, listen, they're trying to make it through the same battle. How many of you recognize, Paul said, we're in a battle here. We are in a battle. And it's not a battle of flesh and blood. We're battling principalities and powers and rulers in dark places. And there's somebody that's just looking for you to extend them a hand of mercy. Even though they're grouchy, even though they're not fun to be around, God's saying, would you just love on them a little bit? Would you just give them a break? Would you just show the love of Jesus to somebody this week? I mean, this week, this Easter week, could you just take that person and say, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make myself. It's a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. And I'm going to make myself. Even though I don't feel like it, even though my flesh still wants to rise up, I'm going to say, I'm, go I'm going to walk in forgiveness. I'm going to take my offense to God. I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to step into this situation and work a miracle. When I looked up this story, you can see Charlie Brown's family his children, and his grandchildren. And that tells me that by extending mercy, when the rules of engagement call for judgment. Listen, Stickler was in the rules of war to shoot that man down. He was in the rules of engagement to down that plane and for every soldier on the inside to die. 
But when, we, when he broke off of man's rules of engagement and said, I just can't stand the thought of finishing somebody off. I, I, want, I want you to get a, a, a picture of this. How many people in your life that the flesh may say, man, I'd like to just finish you off and be done with having to deal with you. But if you would just step into a place of mercy, if you would step in and walk in forgiveness and say, God, I, I don't feel like it, but I'm going to do it because you forgave me. God, I, I, I don't feel like I'm able, but God, you are able to go to the cross. And God, I'm going to forgive. And allow them the opportunity to reproduce life again. Charlie Brown had the opportunity for life to be reproduced. And there are people in your life that need an opportunity for mercy. And you may be the only one they'll get it from. I want to tell you, they're not going to get it from the world. They're not going to get it from the world. They know they're going to get it from us. When we recognize God's love was unconditional towards us, now, God, I'm going to show unconditional love towards someone else. I want every head bowed and every eye closed tonight. I just really feel like I need to give this altar call tonight like this. That There may be people in this place maybe you've tried to ignore it tried to forget about it but you struggle with real forgiveness you struggle with giving mercy you struggle with not allowing anger to rule when it comes to certain people it may even be with yourself you may have a hard time you may be angry with yourself or have a hard time forgiving yourself but I want to tell you tonight because of the unconditional love of God that same love and mercy is available tonight. You can forgive yourself because God's forgiven you. You can forgive that other person because God has forgiven you. If you're in here tonight and you can say, Pastor, I, I need forgiveness to begin to reign in my life. I don't need to know what it is, but you'd be honest enough to say there needs to be real forgiveness in my life. Would you slip up your hand tonight? Anybody in this place? I see those hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. This is what I want to do tonight. I want to. I want to. I want you to stand on your feet. We're going. We had six or seven people that raised their hand tonight. And I'm going to pray. If you raised your hand, I just want to tell you. It doesn't matter who, when, or how the offense occurred. I want to tell you, God can bring. A real miracle into that situation if you'll make up your mind tonight God I am not walking in unforgiveness any longer Lord I'm gonna allow your word to reign in my life your word that says I that you gave me mercy so I'll give it to somebody else and I want to pray with you whatever that offense is I want you to think of that person that it's with and as I pray tonight I want you to just tell the Lord, say, God, I forgive this person. Lord, I forgive this offense. You say, well, I, Pastor, I really don't feel like that. I didn't ask you about how you felt. I said, just tell the Lord, God, I forgive it. Listen, out of faith, God, out of faith, I'm going to forgive tonight and believe that you're going to move me into a place of unity and peace. In Jesus' name. Father, right now, God, as we pray, God, I thank you that you have called us to be a church that walks in mercy. God, you've called us to be a church that walks in unity. And God, tonight, is there are offenses in each of our lives, possibly, that keep us from walking in our full potential in you. God, tonight, I call upon you to step into every situation. God, step into the picture and allow forgiveness to begin to reign. God, in every angry situation, Lord, I thank you that peace and calm is stepping in right now in Jesus' name. God, I thank you as your children 
begin to operate in the obedience of your word and they bring the offense to you that the guidance of the Holy Spirit is going to woo through them, that the guidance of the Holy Spirit is going to begin to operate in their life. And God, that we will see the fruit of it. God, that people that once looked like they were about to be finished off, God, we're going to see new life spring up. God, we're going to see joy come back where it seemed to be no way. And I thank you, God, and I praise you, Lord, because you honor your word. God, I thank you that we are able tonight to walk in unconditional love because you had unconditional love for us when you died for us, God, and we love you tonight. I thank you for moving in every way. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen and amen. Well, listen, I want to thank you again for being what a great crowd tonight it's good to see everybody listen invite somebody that's unchurched or hadn't been to church in a long time invite them to come back sunday amen and uh, i believe we're going to have a great time in the lord this easter sunday and we look forward to seeing each one of you there amen god bless and we hope you have a wonderful wonderful evening